right, in 10.5, we're going to be looking at the probability of um, two or three or more events happening in sequence, one right after the other. Um, so for our example in the intro video here, let's um, let's pick a card. Actually, let's pick um, two cards. All right. Here's how we're going to pick the card, the, or the two cards. Here's my fantastic drawing of two cards. So we've got a deck of cards. We're going to pick out a card. We're going to put that card back, and we're going to pick another card. Okay. And the reason why we're doing that is so that um, it's basically the same experiment twice. When we put the card back, we restore the deck to its original wholeness. And when we go to pick this card, this whatever this is doesn't affect what this is. Okay. Now, if you can grasp that, that is what we call independent. When the first thing does not affect the second thing, uh, then that's called independent. Okay, so if we put the card back, that doesn't affect what the second card is. This could be the king of, of diamonds. Put it back, this could be the king of diamonds as well. They just don't have any effect on each other. That's called independent. So, um, let's ask ourselves, what's the probability of first getting a king and then getting... Um, uh, let's say an even numbered card where we don't count like uh, the face cards as having a e being even or odd okay only the, the numbered cards here okay so what's the probability of getting a king and then so and or and then okay happening in sequence one thing happening right after the other um, then getting an even okay well Let's remember that probability probability is defined as um, the number of outcomes in our event, okay? The number of outcomes in the event that we just described. So the event would be we get a king and an and, and even um, over the number of total outcomes. So if we can count the number of total uh, outcomes in the event and, and the number of total outcomes overall, you know, the number of ways you can pick two cards, um, then, we'll, you know, then we'll have the probability of what we're looking for. So how can we count how many ways there are to get a king and then an even? Well, this is 10.1 stuff. This is prob the, uh, the fundamental counting principle. How many ways are there to get a king? Well, there's four kings, so there's four ways to get a king. Times, how many ways are there to get... Uh, an even numbered card. Let, let's just think for a second. We got two, four, six, eight, and ten in any given suit. Uh, so that's five per suit times four. There's twenty even numbered cards. So there's four times twenty. Um, it's eighty ways to get a king and an even. So this counts all the ways you could get the king of spades and then the ten of clubs and then the, or you could get the king of hearts and the two of diamonds. It counts all the possible uh, combinations of getting a king and then an even. Okay, okay. so that is the numerator here. That's the number of ways that we can have this happen. How many ways can you pick two cards? Well, the first card has 52 possibilities, and since we put the card back, there's 52 possibilities for the second card. So we've counted uh, all the ways that the event can happen and all the ways that two cards can be picked. So that's just 4 times 20 over 52 times 52, um, which is also the same as... 4 over 52 times 20 out of 52. Okay. So what I want you to notice here is that 4 out of 52 is the probability of getting a king. Um, and 20 out of 52 is the probability of getting an even. And the probability of getting a king times the probability of getting an even is the probability of getting a king then an even. And recreate this experiment only slightly different. You know, make this a ten, make this a heart, make this a, a, a number less than four, or make this a red card. Whatever you want to do, it's going to be the same thing. You're going to multiply the two probabilities together. Right? So the probability of any two events happening in sequence, if they're independent, that's the important thing to remember here. If one thing does not affect the other then we have the probability of A times the
times the probability of B. Okay. Um, so that's for independent. Independent. Now, what about, let's change up colors here. What if we conduct the experiment a little bit differently? We're going to look at the king and then even, but what we're going to do is not put this card back. We're going to assume we picked a king, we keep it, and then we pick another card uh, and try to make that card uh, even. We want that card to be even. So just slightly differently, this is what we call with replacement. And this is what we call without replacement. When we talk about not putting the card back, that's we don't replace the card. So it's without replacement. All right. Um, so how does that change things? Um, what's the probability of, of getting a king? Well, it's still 4 out of 52. But then, what's the probability of getting an even? Um, and the the thing that comes to my mind is it, it depends. It depends on whether this was a, a king or if it wasn't. Right? The probability of, of getting this even second, it, it's different depending on whether you get a king or you don't. Um, so that's what we call dependent. So, because it depends, the, the probability of the second one depends on whether or not uh, you got a king here, right? Because if you did get a king, then, um, you know, it, that would be okay because the king's not even or odd, so we still have 20 even cards, but if you don't get a king and you possibly got an even here, um, now that affects the second one, right? So that's what we call dependent. Now... What we're going to do, we want to get a king first. We're going to assume that we did get a king. So we did get a king. So what's the probability, given that we got a king here, what's the probability that we get an even? Well, like we said, a king is not even or odd, so um, there are still 20 even cards to pick out of. Uh, but now there are only 51 cards in the deck because if we have picked this first card. We're assuming it's a king, um, which depletes the pool of total cards by one card, leaving 51 cards. Okay, um, so and it, the purpose of this is not to multiply these together. You can multiply these together and, and figure out exactly what that is, but it's just 4 times 20, or 52 times 51. It's just multiplying fractions together, right? Um, so you got independent and you've got dependent. So let's highlight some of the important pieces here. Um, this guy right here for independent events. That works. For dependent events, the probability of A then B, or the probability of A and B, I like then because in section 10.4 we already use the word and, and it's kind of confusing. So specifically um, in 10.5, then is the important uh, word here. In 10.4, um, and meant that uh, we did one thing, and that one thing was, say, like a king and a diamond, and a diamond at the same time. In this one, when we say king and diamond, we mean to pick a king on one card, and a completely separate card, we pick a diamond. So that's why I use then. It's a, it's much more specific, um, because it means that this happens, and then this happens. So, anyway. For this one, for, for, indep or for uh, dependent events, well, the first thing you'll see is just you know, you have a whole deck of cards. So the probability of getting a king is just the probability of getting a king. So this is the probability of A. But then this, what we multiply here is slightly different. Okay, we want the probability of B, but depending on what happens here for A, um, the probability of B is a little different than it would be otherwise. Right? So we say the probability of B given A. Given that A already happened, what's the probability of the second thing happening? Given that we picked a king, the probability of getting an even numbered card is slightly different. It is slightly higher uh, because we have one less card that we could fail with, right? So um, the 
probability of B given that we picked a king. Probability of B even given that we get a king is 20 out of 51. So we have to take that into account when these events are dependent. One affects the other. Um, okay, and that is the other important thing there. Okay, so the last thing I want to talk about, um, we're going to use what's called a probability tree. And we're going to talk about one of my favorite pastimes, which is disc golf. And uh, this is a, often my disc of choice. It's the Pro Katana. Uh, so here's what's going to happen is um, two things are going to happen in sequence, but it's, we could go two different ways. Okay, So um, you, you get up in the, the, the tee box, and you, you, you go to throw your disc, and you, you hope it's a good drive, a decent drive. So for me, let's say that I, I'm just guessing here, and perhaps embellishing. Let's say that I get a decent drive, decent drive, 60% of the time. I mean, not great. Uh, so that would mean that 40% of the time, or 0.4 of the time, I get a, a, you know, undesirable drive. Okay. So let's say that I, whenever I get a decent drive, um, the the likelihood that I'll, I'll get par for that hole, um, let's say that uh, you know eighty percent of the time I get par if I've got a decent drive, um, and the rest of the time I just I don't get par. I might bogey or double bogey or or so on. So that's twenty percent of the time. Um, well, even if I have a, an undesirable drive, let's say that, um, let's just say it's 50-50. 50% of the time uh, I par, and the other 50 I don't. All right. So the question is, on any given hole, when I step up to the tee box, what's the probability of par? probability of me getting par on that hole. Um, well, I could get par this way or this way. Right? That's the probability of um, that I had a decent drive. And then, uh, let's, let's do then, decent drive, then I got par. Plus um, the probability that I got an undesirable drive, then I got par. Okay. Um, so two separate realities. I could have gone this way or this way. Either I got a decent drive and then I got par, or I didn't get a decent drive and I still got par. And that together would be the probability that I get par. I could go either way. Good drive, bad drive, par, par. Um, so and if you're having trouble understanding disc golf, it's a lot like regular golf as far as scoring goes, so uh, if that helps at all. Um, so what's the probability that I get a decent drive and then I get par? Um, well, 60% of the time, I'm going to get a decent drive. Okay, so here's, here's all the times that I take a drive. And 60% of that, which is somewhere in the neighborhood of, of right there, 60% of the time, I have a decent drive. Okay, now 60% of the time I have a decent drive, and 80% of that time, so that's about half, this is close to 80%, 80% of that time, I'll go on to get par. Right? So 80% of 60% of the entire time, I get uh, par this way. So it'll just be 0.6 times 0.8. Plus, what's the probability that I have a, a bad drive, a poor drive, and then I still get par? All right, well, um, so the other 40% of the time, let's go back this way, 40% of the time, I throw poorly. And then 50% of that time, 
I still managed to get par. Um, so there's another way I can get par. So that's 50% of 40% of the entire time. So 50% of 40%. Now we just add these together. Um, let's pull up the calculator. And we do 0.6 times 0.8. Five times point four. That's point two. So we have point six eight. So uh, if these numbers were correct, which they probably aren't, just totally made them up guessing. Uh, Sixty-eight percent chance of getting par on a hole. Okay, so you you see how we arrived at that. So we'll do. Um, Probably one more of those in the sample problems video as well as others. Uh, thanks for watching. Hope that was helpful.